Hello and welcome to episode 9 of Path to Power. I'm Matt Cooper. And I'm Ivan Yates. And we need to start with a declaration of interest today because we're going to be talking about RT in some length. And we are recording this podcast in the studios of Noel Kelly Management. And we should say that because obviously part one of the RT crisis began with the Ryan Tuberty affair and Ryan is managed by Noel Kenny Management. And the reason I'm saying that now is that I don't want anyone saying afterwards that we neglected to recollect. Because that's very much the phrase of the day, neglected to recollect. That's what Shuan Nirali, the RT chairwoman, now deposed, didn't tell Catherine Martin, the media minister, apparently, that she and others signed off on the exit deal for the former finance director at RT, Richard Collins. Now, she says she told officials in the minister's department, but we had the extraordinary spectacle last night, and I say this, Ivan, given that we're recording this on a Friday morning, this podcast, of a minister essentially sacking the chair of RT live on an RT television programme last night, because what else could Shun Nirali do other than resign in the small hours of the morning after what the minister had said? Yeah, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, in an interview on Primetime last night with Miriam O'Callaghan, uh, it was a public execution. Uh, no question about it. Um, but uh, Sorry, was that the right way of going about things? Particularly, I mean, she saved herself a meeting with Shuni Riley this morning inside in her department. Ah, look, it, it reflects desperately uh, on on Catherine Martin. Even if you believe her story. Uh, basically last October when the uh, exit package was done for the former CFO Richard Collins, uh, the department were told. Now the normal procedure is that the principal officer would tell the assistant secretary, would tell the secretary general who'd make a memo for the minister. So the fact that the Sorry, minister... Does that, does that always happen? I mean, no, absolutely I, does. I oh, mean, so, I think there's plenty of examples where ministers say that they were never given anything and the memos don't go up the well, well, sorry. The, the first principle of a civil servant when they're inducted, there's a big thing written on the wall, C-Y-A, cover your arse. <laughs> and the way you cover your arse is you do a memo and it goes up the line. And that applies at all ranks to the civil service that you've you've done your, your pass, bit, you, you've passed it on. But sorry, the implication of this is, is that Catherine Martin asked Shuni Raleigh, did anyone sign off on this? Given all the controversy that there has been about the deal that Kevin Backhurst did with Rory Coveney on the way out for a sum still undisclosed but believed to be for about 200000 a year's salary, that there were obvious questions to be asked. Well, the others who went, did they get a package? And from what Catherine Martin is saying, and, you know, by the time this podcast comes out, there may have been developments in what we know of what Catherine Martin knew and what she was told. But... I mean, would it seem, shouldn't Raleigh surely should have said, just to remind you, rather than neglecting to recollect, well, actually, I was part of the subcommittee of the board which signed off on the Richard Collins deal. Yeah, and sorry, we've had months now of two Oireachtas committees pursuing exit packages. So we had Breda O'Keefe, the 451, and no one really showed up or explained and they lawyered up about that. So that remains unanswered. There's the circumstance relation to Richard Collins. There's circumstance relation to Rory and there's also the David Nally case, which was another exit where he was moved from one job to another job. Sorry, there was no interviews for a very highly paid job, newly created position to move him from his position as the managing editor of Current Affairs. And and he was moved to some advisory position and then sometime later, I think in early 24, he left. Or early 23. Uh, early 23 he left. So those, so like how... The civil servants, the minister, the chairperson wouldn't be saying, these are live files. These these are things that we've written to these people asking them to waive their, uh, uh, you know, confidentiality. But can, can I say this? Can I say this? Because we've been, you know, on this podcast alone, we've talked about RT a number of times. And people talked about Ryan Tuberty for months. They talked about corporate governance. Let's, let's really nail this once and for all. Because uh, I'm looking at who's going to be the next chairperson, right? Are you putting yourself in the wrong place? No, I'm, I'm, I have three names for you. I have three names for you. And not, you're not one yourself. No, Would you not be no. a former government minister with no, plenty of I'm, experience no, in, I in broadcasting? I'm not, I, I'm not tough enough. I'm, I'm too, <laughs> too meek and mild for what needs to be done here. Okay, give so, me your three well, names. Well, 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 can I say, first of all, where I'm coming from on this? And, and and I think this runs to the heart of government. I've actually been thinking a lot about this over recent days. And I actually think since Leo became Taoiseach in December 22, a number of things have happened. 
Martin Fraser has left, who was there for a decade, really running the country. There's a new. So just explain to people who is Secretary, Secretary General in the Department of the Taoiseach. A- and sec- he sits at Cabinet. It's the most important job in government. He sits right beside the Taoiseach. He looks after the agenda. He does everything. Uh, so he's been replaced by John Callanan. Uh, Robert Watt has moved out of the kind of finance area and we have John Hogan, Secretary General in finance. And my point is this. So no, no, Robert Watt was in public expenditure. That's right, that's right. And he's gone to help. But uh, what I'm saying is that the the superstructure that was there in Fraser's regime actually was fit for purpose. And I think it made Enda Kenny look good at times. And they took tough decisions over a decade. And I, I think provided reasonable government for the country. I'm coming to the view, Matt, and this is a really serious point. Since some point in 22, the government have actually developed a complete lack of authority in terms of throwing money at every problem that comes along. And so RTE is a case in point. In the last 18 months, they have thrown 71 million at RTE. Now that doesn't account for... I don't think all that money has been transferred as yet. I think two two tranches of 20 million for this year, uh, 40 million in total, have not gone across yet to my knowledge. 71 million has been publicly declared it's going to be a bailout for RTE. This in top of 50 million that they got. Now, do remember this. If we go back four or five years, uh, the funding for TG Car was taken out, 54 million put in separately. The funding for the orchestras were dealt with under a different subhead. So the subsidies had just been rolling. This, there has been corporate governance failures. There's been sensational schmozzles and catastrophe for the minister. RT is incapable of reforming itself. The department is incapable. But at the heart of this is a financial crisis to do with the fact that terrestrial TV do, is not, on a scheduled basis, is not going to survive in 10 years' time. The BBC say that. And so what I'm trying to say to you is this. The three people I would look to appoint, right? The first one will just wind you up and annoy you. But I put it like this. It just tells you the mood music of we've got a financial crisis. What do we need to do? Michael O'Leary would be straight out of the bat. Ah, now, come on. That's a ridiculous idea. Why? Well, first of all, he never does anything outside of Reiner. He doesn't take on other directorships and the rest of it. And you also have to have somebody who doesn't just think always commercially. Yes, you have to have somebody who thinks commercially, but they also have to have a public sector belief and ethos about them and he does not have that. You're cracking me up. You should do stand-up. No, the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, the problem is financial. There are 1,900 people there. You know what I hear is happening in RTE? That actually the NUJ is recruiting people on contract and otherwise simply to have a resistance campaign and the position is we want everyone to get one year's salary and there is no meaningful redundancy happening. That is, my other two people are Michael McAteer. Michael McAteer has years of experience in rationalising uh, companies ex uh, Grant Thornton uh, in terms of he was managing partner there. And Kieran, I know Mick and I think you can see why he would make a good job. Okay, and Kieran here. Wallace is the other one, ex KPMG. And I sorry, think he's th- more of a liquidator. <laughs> th- th- sorry, sorry, sorry. This is where I'm going with this because I can. I want to. I just want to give you a little bit of a history lesson. I'm going to give you three examples in my lifetime where uh, an indispensable public company ran into distress. Irish Shipping in November 1984 had to be uh, liquidated. Aer Lingus in 2006 was privatised and the BNI line in 1992 was eventually sold to ICG, Irish Continental Lines. In both, in all those cases, they were provided, this is an island, they were providing a, fundal, a fundamental access issue. And actually, the can was kicked down the road. There were sticking plaster solutions and actually they ran out of road. And the same is going to happen over the next decade with RTE. And I'm saying that there is nobody, Leo, Michal, actually looking at the extent of this financial crisis and how it's going to be cumulative. OK, there's a few things. And I want to come back and discuss Kevin Backer's position in just a little while. But what you say about how this crisis sort of has been handled in the last 18 months since there's been a change in the civil servants advice in the government. I'll disagree with you there. I'll tell you why I disagree with you. This crisis for RT has been known for well over a decade. Noel Curran, who was the Director General, very much foresaw what was going to happen. 
And he pointed out about the need for a dramatic restructuring of what RT was. What year how is this, roughly? This is going back 10 years ago. Okay. Right? We're going back 10 years ago. And he looked about how the licence fee should be made available partly to the private sector and greater cooperation because he could see the trends that were going with audience numbers that were quite clear a decade ago. And remember, the RT licence has not been increased since 2008. It went up to €160 in 2008. RT then had a financial crisis as a result of the crash, which affected all media. And they had a dramatic contraction of income. And they did certain work in reducing their costs didn't do a particularly good job of it. What they did at the time is they went for some of the headline figures you know, for big top 10 presenters and the rest of it. They outsourced an awful lot of their redundancies or their cost cutting effectively to the private sector, those who were selling into RT independent programming or whatever, cut their budgets. Now, there are certain safeguards in legislation on behalf of the independent sector, but they found it very tough. RT looks after itself before it looks after them. Anyway, the point is, these issues have been discussed with governments after government over the last 10 years. There have been appeals made for a change in the funding structure or for a licence fee increase. Now, you can say they didn't deserve a licence fee increase because of the shenanigans that they've been up to. But you can also say that an awful lot of the shenanigans happened almost in the desperation of RT to try and find money elsewhere. So, you've had in recent years, you had, for example, the Future Media Commission set up it gave 50 recommendations. The government accepted 49. It rejected the one it didn't like, which was fully state funding for RTE. And there's still division in government in relation to this. But for the point you're making is, sure, you know, they say they don't want fully state funding because they don't want to have an element of control over RTE. There might as well at the moment. There's so much money going into the place. It's not just the money you said about the extra top-ups. Even with the licence fee, all the over 70s and rather people who don't have to pay a licence fee because of their income. That's topped up by the Department of Social Protection. But, uh, but uh, there is something new. There is right. something new. Okay. And it's only emerged since the middle of last year. And that was non-compliance with the licence fee. Oh, like, yeah. People didn't like the licence fee and there's been debates about uh, uh, communications, telco, broadbands, tax. There's been, you know, different and state uh, funding and all this kind of thing. But where, where this has really escalated from losing 30 to 50 million a year to losing 100 million a year is because now people are seeing well, if I don't pay my licence, what's the downside of this? It's like the water rates, you know, the domestic water, water charges, rates. Yeah. yeah, and so so obviously uh, Sinn Féin have promised Sorry, an amnesty. This, this happened before the whole Ryan Tobody yeah. issue and things that have come out afterwards. There was already a dramatic decline. But it's exponential people, now. But now it's becoming exponential. So, and so, it, sorry, apparently things were picking up again in January, that the sort of like when there had been a lull in the bad news, people started renewing. I wonder what the hell is going to happen now after what's happened in the last three weeks. So this makes the situation even tougher. But can I bring in Kevin Backhurst? Yeah. Because it, uh, Kevin Backhurst this morning issued a statement to all staff praising Shuan Nirali to the hilt. Wonderful chairman had given him fantastic support. Well, of course she had. She appointed him. And, and this is not a criticism of Kevin Backhurst. But the certain I mean, Shuni Rally, I think, was fortunate to still be chairwoman before she actually handed in her notice in the early hours of this morning. Because I think she has done an awful lot of things very poorly since the middle of the summer in handling the public disclosures in relation to Ryan Tuberty and then all of the other issues that came along. But also the circumstances in which Kevin Backhurst himself got the job are deserving of more scrutiny. Because Shuni Raleigh had one outstanding candidate other than Kevin Backhurst. David McRedmond. David McRedmond. And for those who don't know who David McRedmond is, and I put my hands on the table, or my cards on the table here, I would regard David as a friend. He became a friend. And I got to know him from when he was a chief executive of TV3. He brought me in, first of all, to do the Rugby World Cup in 2007 and then to do Gaelic Games for the next six years. And I've developed a very good relationship with him. Well, it's his record in on Puss that is really... I'm sorry, no. It was his record in TV3. He actually faced financial meltdown for TV3 at the time of the crisis. He was very tough in the way that he went about cutting costs, 
to save that business. Now, they also got a debt write down in relation to loans from Anglo-Irish Bank, which was very much required. But he also looked after the cost base and made sure, in a way that you say Michael O'Leary coming in would, you know, be ruthless in relation to costs. David did that job and built Virgin Media. They lost things like Coronation Street for a while. So he went out and he did things like he got the 2015 Rugby World Cup. He went and he got the uh, Six Nations Rugby to give TV3 as it was then before it became Virgin Media to maintain its relevance. And he relevant. applied for the DG he, position. He brought, he, sorry, and again, sorry, just sort of things. He brought in Vincent Brown to do The Tonight Show, which revolutionised current affairs coverage. And then the two of us were brought in to do it when Vincent stepped on when he retired. So he has a track record in programming. He has a track record in innovation. He had a track record in cost cutting. The first time the RT job came up, when D Forbes got it, David didn't even get an interview. There, and he was regarded as the barbarian who would have been left in because even though the fact his own father had worked in RT and he has a very strong public service ethos, he wasn't actually given an interview. He was given an interview this time and he applied for the job to replace D Forbes and Shunni Raleigh and two others interviewed him and it was cursory. It was almost like a box ticking mm. exercise. And what I have heard, and I'm sure you've heard this as mm. well, is that senior executives in RT were telling Shu and Nirali, we don't want this guy in here. We don't want his commercial approach. To Some of these people who didn't turn up to subsequent committee yes. hearings. He would have been exactly what they needed. Now, that is not in any way to say that, Dave, that Kevin Backhurst may not be the man who can do all the right things in RTE. What? But David McRedmond and should, should have, could have been, should have been, given what he has done subsequently in Unpost, where he has shown that he has an ability to turn around a public service organisation and has done so brilliantly there. He could have done the same in RT and Shun Lee Rally has to never fully answer the questions as to why she did not progress him beyond even the first interview. I, I think both... Um Backhurst and D Forbes got the job on the basis that they would be the best people to extract more exchequer support for RT. And I think that's a really bad way to run a railroad. As regards Shunni Raleigh, I said at the time, I repeated, she was like a rabbit in the headlights. Uh, she was completely out of her depth. And I, I'm sorry, she just wasn't fit for purpose. Well, no, that, on that's Backhurst, a fair I opinion to, to have. I, I want to come to Backhurst. Now, because just before this blew up, Backhurst has been making the case that so I'm now going to give a global centre of excellence award to RTE in entitlement, right? That that is my take on it. And the the the, the cheerleader for that has been Backhurst, because he has been arguing over recent months, with some success with Sinn Fein and with Leo, to say that this is a public institution. It's it's almost like the HSE or on Garda Síochána. And he's been saying it's a vital part of Irish life. It must be in public hands and all that goes with that in terms of public funding. Simultaneously, what has he been saying? When he negotiated with Richard Collins a confidentiality clause, that all the rules that applied to Angarda Shikon and the HSE in terms of the public accounting mechanism, an accounting officer, the CNAG, and all of that annual processes, you know what I mean? Which sorry, means sorry, full the CNAG does not cover RT. Does no, that, this no. is my point. Okay. No, sorry, he was arguing that RT should be treated the same as public institutions, which will always be public, like AGS okay. or, or, or like the HSE. What I'm saying is simultaneously. Simultaneously, he was facing in two directions at the one time because he wanted commercial freedom, like your deal with Today FM or mine with News Talk, is confidential. It's commercial and it's confidential and it's a condition of the contract. At a policy level, at a policy level, here he is with his begging cap out to government saying this is a vital, vital pillar of the state and that we must have a public sector, public service broadcasting. As you would say, we must have a police force, we must have a public health service. That is that is his pitch. But at the same what's time... What's wrong with that? There's no, sorry, well, first of all, I have a huge problem with that because it costs 240 million a year, which I don't think the public wants to pay for. There's better things you could spend it on. But simultaneously, he negotiated with Coveney and with Collins completely private sector deals. Do you not get that contradiction? Okay, okay. Let, let me just say a couple of things in relation to Kevin Backhurst. I, I, I don't know the man 
uh, apart from having interviewed him a couple of times uh, since he came into the job in RT. I'd never met him during his previous time in RT. I, I know people who I would like and trust within RT who I think are good judges of character who say that he is a good person, right? That he is very well motivated and that he takes his job very seriously. And I have to say, you know, he could have actually dodged out of taking up this position because the shit started hitting the fan just before he was due to take over. The stuff started tumbling out at the end of D Forbes, waiting for him to take her reign of error. And basically when he was, before he came in, he could have said, do you know what, lads? Uh, I've been thinking about this and he could have cited family reasons. I don't want to move across. He took up the job. Now, I wonder since, has he regretted that in his quieter moments, in his private moments? Does he ever go, like, particularly when he has to go in in front of the Oireachtas Media Committee to be followed by the Public Accounts Committee and do all these interviews and then face everything inside an RT? Does he think, Jesus, why did I ever take this on? And I wonder as well that, you know, I, I don't anticipate, I think before Shunni Rahli's resignation, and I actually was writing a piece for tomorrow's Irish Daily Mail about this, saying that he was unsackable because they really couldn't go through the process of trying to replace him again. I think he's even more unsackable now that Shu and Lee Raleigh has gone because you can't lose the chief executive at the same time as you don't have a chairman. The issue may be for him is what type of chairman does he actually get? And Sorry, that, that does might change his position. Does, where is there anything in his CV that he has the skills to downsize and restructure and rationalise RTE? He has never done that type of job before. No, he's an editorial person. And he's, he's done regulatory stuff. I'm like, He's a journal. Like, he's a smoke and mirrors man. Let's take call for what he is. No, I, like, I, no not a smoke and mirrors man. Sorry, that, that, that's uh, denigrating sorry, his I abilities tell, tell, as an editorial I want person. To be specific, specific, but I think the I point, you're making, about but the point you're making is actually good. And I, with one thing, that's, I was rather taken aback but by two things last year when they spoke about the need to restructure. 1,900 people to get rid of 20% of the people with, by 2028, many of which by nas- national, natural attrition. And you're going, Jesus, that wouldn't happen in the private sector. You wouldn't be given that time. Exacerbated by the fact that the amount of redundancies they're looking for in the first year is 40 out of 1,900. And you're going, hold on a second. That is not the way the real world works. And can I tell you about the real world? You look at your Googles, look at Accenture and look at pharma companies. When they had a downturn in revenue in 22, 23, they simply shedded thousands of people simply because the world had changed. The post-COVID surge of revenues had disappeared. Now, the fact of the matter is he has no skills in areas of rationalisation. He has no financial skills. He actually, if you look at his programme, it's a phantom programme. It's based on voluntary redundancies over four years and you know what's happening as we speak in Montrose people are licking their lips to say I want a bigger cheque and there's a campaign of resistance But you can't up. blame people for trying to look after themselves No, no but what I'm saying is that the, the, the real downside of these uh, horrendous payoffs and exit deals have actually created a new norm of at least a year's salary well, I, I don't think so I think what they've done is that they've probably impacted negatively on what everybody is going to get on the way out But and people are going, going to say Coveney got in, this in, for in, failure yeah, on a toy, the and, toy and, show and now when everyone says because these figures were wrong, nobody else is going to benefit in the same way again, so, which then creates its own difficulty in that they might find it much harder to get people to take voluntary redundancy packages, which then brings up the issue as to whether you actually have to have compulsory redundancies, which is what the government has already indicated it does not want. I think it said it didn't want it because it was afraid of a political kickback and a public okay. backlash, except the only thing I think now is that I suspect the public is becoming so fed up with RTE and doesn't want to pay its licence fees, would not care particularly okay. if 900 people or 1,000 people were made redundant, which is very tough for the people working in RTE. Right. I, I take it you're a defender of Shunni Rafferty. You're an apologist for Kevin sorry, Backhurst. Never, sorry. No, oh, no, 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 no. You, let's, you, let's call, you haven't no, been but, listening to no, me. No, no, no. But the, the, the core point is you're, you're not accepting. My central point is that this government, whether it's a problem in planning, whether it's a problem with migrants, whether it's a problem in the health service, the Pavlovian response since mid-22 is to simply throw money at the problem. And this is going to create a legacy in the future. And I believe the guy that's, that everyone condemns, Owen Harris, always had a saying called good authority. 
in every walk of life, good authority is that you're not loved, you're respected. You're doing the right thing and you're doing the right thing for the long term. I honestly believe the road that they're going down of just putting RTE under the carpet of exchequer uh, financing is, and in fairness to Fianna Fáil, McGrath and Martin have not gone this, although did you notice in Martin's interview, I think it was on Sunday. Michael he said, Martin now rather than Catherine Martin. Yeah, absolutely. He said, well, of course, all this will actually apply in 2025 when there's a new government. Okay, but there's a few things I want to say and I, I'm not sure you f- get clear entirely where I'm going in relation to RTE. There is an issue as to whether RTE is run for the benefit of the public that pays for it, either through the licence fee or through exchequer funding, or is run for the benefit of the people who work in there. And I'm sure there are lots of people who work inside an RTE will be pissed off to hear me saying this and say it's easy for me to say this from outside in the commercial sector, but... The world has changed so much. I think there actually has to be... We were talking about cutting and trimming RTE as if it continues to provide all the services that it actually does. So, you know, the newspaper industry, for example, is furious and has been furious about over the last decade or so as they've been trying to make the transition to digital. RTE has been able to use its funds to build its own website, which has nothing to do with broadcasting, Mm. but effectively has become a competition and a source of news to the Irish Times, the Irish Examiner, the Independent, all of the rest of it. So, you know, you could say that that's unfair competition. The commercial radio stations will argue, why is it that 2FM continues? What public service is there in 2FM? There might have been back in the day when it was set up when you had no other competition, but there are licences now in the private sector for other stations who are providing what 2FM does. Why does that continue to exist? There was a plan five years ago in RTE to cut back to get rid of uh, RTE2 television. That was dumped because internally how we want to keep it. There, even in what Kevin Backer said last year was about new developments, things like podcasts, like we're Mm -hmm. doing, that RTE want to go into that market as well. And you look at it and you go, hold on a second. Yes, we know the world is changing and you want to invest in all the new things to remain relevant. And I can understand why they do that. But the government has to say, well, why are you doing that? What public service is there in going out to compete and stuff that the private sector is already doing? So, I mean, two years ago, I concluded that RT under any DG was incapable of reform. So where you have a state body like that, you look to the department to do it. I, I've said throughout the summer, Catherine Muppet Martin is was incapable ah, of, of doing Ivan, it. Ivan, let, let's that's not, not new. Yeah, I've I know, said that consistently. Yeah, I've mean, been consistent. Let, let, let's, no. let's not descend so do you to think personal, the events of this, personal abuse. No, no, do you not think the events of this week vindicate everything I've said about her? She was out of her depth. The Secretary General of her department and her department are not fit for purpose when it comes to all of this. Sorry, this kind of rigour of actually making people accountable is unpleasant at times, but the fact of the matter is someone's got to do it because we live in a country where, ah, sure, it'll be all right. Ah, sure, all the government are concerned about their own skins in the next election. And so that, that leadership comes from the top. And this is a matter for the Taoiseach and the Taunish to, to assert their authority. And what are they doing? They're simply running away from the problem, pushing it into 2025. And I don't think that's leadership. That is no, actually but, an but, abdication but, of leadership. But could it be that they actually there is there are genuine differences of opinion in the government as how to sort this out? As in, whether they actually go ahead with a full exchequer funding or whether they turn the licence fee collection over to the revenue commissioners instead of on post, that there are genuine difficulties in coming to a consensus. But sorry, at the end of the day, who has to take responsibility for this? Well, that's true. It won't be Catherine Martin, it'll have to be the government. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, my central point, if I only had one sentence to sum up RTE, please stop being distracted by Ryan Tuberty, by corporate governance, by chairpersons and personalities. This is a financial crisis which is out of control. And in all financial crises, f- crises follow the money because this is going to get but can worse. Can I tell you something else about this? And everyone, I think there's been a working assumption in the way the government has dealt with this and the way RT has dealt with this. And that assumption is, is that no matter what, there will always be an RTE. So within RT, they've always had this thing, well, we will be saved. We will continue to exist. And the government has been working on the basis that there's an absolute requirement for RT that's important. You won't know what you have until it's gone. So, you know, let's give a certain degree of credit to RT for doing things 
that the commercial sector would not do. But let's not exaggerate the fact of what it does because there are things that it does that the commercial sector does equally as well. And therefore someone like Michael O'Leary, Michael McAteer or Kieran Wallace would be able to suss out the wheat from the chaff that you've just outlined. That's what's required in RT. Move on. OK, let's move on to other things, OK? And let's talk about Metrolink. Because yep. let's talk about state. There was uh, Colin McCarthy, the economist, I think was out this week at the start of the oral hearing on Borplanola of the, uh, was it, I'm not sure if it was on Borplanola, but the or- oral hearings that are going on for six weeks into the plan for Metrolink. And he was suggesting nine and a half billion is going to be wasted. There, and then, of course, there are people who say, well, will it ever come in at nine and a half billion? By the time the thing gets built, it'll probably cost 12 or 15 billion. And is this a colossal waste of money? Have we not reached the stage where we should just say this actually is an essential part of infrastructure that needs to be provided, that we should have done this 20 years ago. Then we gave up on it because of the financial crash. We bring it back in. We waste loads of money by changing all of the plans and deciding to start over from scratch again rather than implementing what would have been put in had the crash not come. And now we're into this planning stage and then we have politicians coming along and for local constituency issues, complaining. Jim O'Callaghan of Fianna Fáil, I don't want it at, at Charlemont, the end terminus. It's not a good place to do it. Oh, because the well-heeled people in Dartmouth Square nearby don't want a little bit of inconvenience, perhaps, when the building work is going on and when the uh, people start being disgorged from the train to that. But there's a logic there about how you can then use it as a spur in the future for other lines. He says, do that in Stephen's Green instead. If you were to do that at Stephen's Green instead, they'd have to go back for fresh places planning and change everything. And Marie Sherlock of the Labour Party starts giving out about traffic in Fibsborough uh, when this work would have to be done. You know, yes, there's going to be inconveniences. Yes, there are things that are going to have to be demolished to make way for it. But that's progress. Why do our politicians for local petty interests start complaining about, you know, what is for the greater good? Well, put it like this. I, I see all this in a historical prism. Uh, in 1984, Darsh was constructed. Uh, but for it, you know, all along the East Coast. Jeez, can you imagine the traffic said, congestion absolutely. if we didn't have it and if we didn't have Lewis? I was there. I was there as a transport spokesperson at the time of Lewis in the noughties and all of that and the reality is it on the green and red line now are indispensable assets of the city. I hope you didn't argue about it for the sake of opposition, did you? Did you argue no, no, against I was, it? I, I, no, I was arguing totally in favour of it but I was against this uh, black tunnel that Mary O'Rourke was going to build in the city centre because the River Liffey would have made it inoperable and and they didn't have their engineers. What I want to say is this. First of all, I totally agree with your, your major point, which is this. We just have to suck this up. We have to put the head down and we have to do it. There is a parallel line from the dart that runs from Seatown, Swords, right through to the airport, in through Glasnevin, Ballymun. That area does not have a public transport route. Talk to anyone who gets in a taxi coming out of Dublin Airport. It's a national and international disgrace. Yes, it's going to cost more than nine and a half billion. Yes, it's going to take more than nine years. But we need to grit our teeth and provide for future generations So just like this we did with the port tunnel. Can you imagine if we didn't have the port tunnel? So, 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 like, there, there's no gain saying that the residents, the disruption, the CPO orders, like, but I have to say this, I think it should stop around O'Connell Street. There is a perfectly good Lewis service. You just run more frequent trams, you run more carriages and you actually use the infrastructure that's there. So I, I actually don't see why from O'Connell Street down, I'd link it up to the Lewis, of the, you don't need to go to Tara, Stevens, Green and Charmant because oh. I, I know I frequently get a train to Connolly, go across to Houston, the DART service is perfectly good, it works and, and so therefore, number one, uh, no turning back. Uh, there'll never be a good time. You know, it's never a wrong time to do the right thing. And the right thing to do here is to build Metrolink. And and, and, and sorry, so, I just say I, I did have this discussion with Jim O'Callaghan on the last word during the week, and he got quite angry with me. I think about, you know, implying that he was, he was just nimby, doing this. nimby. Yeah, yeah. And he was saying, oh, I have constituents. There are people who live near the east side of St. Stephen's Green. There are very, very few residential mm. houses that would be impacted over there, unlike they would be to a degree in Ranelagh, which is where Charlemont is. And I don't live too far from there. And I used to live exactly there uh, 
many years ago, it's a good place for people and people will get out. There won't be that many necessarily. And you have the Lewis coming in. People can switch from the Lewis onto that to go out to the airport. And it would be the place where you could start heading southwest if you wanted to have another line in the future going out to Terry Neur, out to Tala as well to mm. link up with the existing Lewis lines. And these are the things they're planning for the future and they're right to be planning for and the future. And people conflating this with the cost overrun of what will probably end up to be two and a half billion. I was laughing at Leo saying, you remember he said before, not another red cent. He said it won't be any more than the 2.2 billion. That's true for this government, the National Journal. But to conflate that issue, there was mission creep there. We need to get the design of this agreed. I actually don't think they need to go south of a country. But at the end of the day, if you want to have a capital city, if you want to have international credibility, you've got to link it to the airport. Uh, there is no proper public transport facility. The buses are ad hoc. The taxis are are basically not fit for purpose because they're all caught in the same congestion. OK, let's move on. European Parliament elections, the selection conventions. And I have to say to you, Ivan, that a few weeks ago when you mentioned the list of uh, potential candidates for Fine Gael in Dublin, you neglected a certain person and I had to remind you yeah. of her. And lo and behold, Regina Doherty has actually won out and become the Fine Gael nominee. But apparently in... Um, slightly acrimonious circumstances between the Fine Gael membership and the party leadership. Although Leo got very annoyed with questions, Leo Varadkar, from Philip Ryan of the Irish Independent. <laughs> His report in relation to this saying it was absolute nonsense. This Philip Ryan, who was his biographer, mm. isn't that remarkable that he would say well, that? Well, let me, let me give you some background goss and insights into this. So last Sunday in DCU, uh, which is slightly, it's on the north side, I think. Uh, uh, I, sorry, I spent a year there. I know exactly okay, where it okay. is. Okay, it's I on the north guess. side. Uh, Fine Gael's vote is on the south side, okay? And Josepha Madigan uh, is in a difficulty of holding two seats with Neil Richmond in Rathdown constituency. She's a junior minister. And like, she's not everyone's cup of tea. She's not everyone's cup of tea, but she is, they've done polling data. She's the most electable of those. Regina appears. So Regina was in Meath West constituency. She uh, moves to Dublin, having lost her seat. Yeah, she's, I thought she was going to go for Richard Bruton's that, seat. Well, put it like this. She, that, that was the whole programme. She decides, as is her entitlement, so... The way this has worked over the years, and the same in Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, is you have headquarters, right? Headquarters have a situation where in every constituency there's a director of organisation, there's a common or branch, branch structure, and basically if they decide we're going to run X, they are able to deliver a vote. What people are saying privately after last Sunday, that John Carroll, the new Leo-inspired uh, Secretary General uh, in Fine Gael headquarters, couldn't deliver a pizza. The fact of the matter is that he absolutely has no connection with the engine under the bonnet of the Fine Gael organisation. And you know where this really gets serious? So Fine Gael could lose Francis Fitzgerald's seat because they'll probably run two candidates now. They mightn't transfer to each other. Real jeopardy, flashing amber light. Let's move, because they, they had quite a lot of seats. They had two in South and they had two in Midlands North East and they had one in Dublin, five. They could actually end up with two seats. Uh, it, the, the situation, Colin Markey, is not a publicly well-known figure. The replacement for Mairead McGuinness, who is a poll topper. They have no strategy either to run three or to have someone stronger than Colin Markey. And Maria Walsh is not impregnable because, you know, she hasn't had a high profile uh, until she's said the male, male, male pale and stale about the Fianna Fáil candidates. That was very good. Did you see? There's two she's things. She certainly wound them up and no, she's got the attention, hasn't well, what she? What Micheál Martin said, two things. One, oh, I haven't heard from Maria for a long time. First cut. Second thing, be careful what you wish for because they might add Lisa Chambers right on her doorstep who's not male pale and stale. But in the South constituency, so the 10th of March is the is the convention uh, for the South constituency and so Deirdre Clune is not standing. They need a strong... Court. Sean Kelly is though. It, but, but, but like Despite the, being a pensioner. There are two, two seats. He's 72, he's from Kerry. But he, he's, he's got a relatively former, safe seat. Yeah, former president of the GA has a very high name recognition. The second, the second seat is in real jeopardy. So, interestingly, a friend of mine, a uh, very successful commercial career, ESB, boss of BGE, eight years chairman of Cork Port, oh, president, Mullins. yeah, is, is, is putting his name forward. Okay. And, and it, it's declared actually today in the examiner. And uh, basically, uh, he is a dark horse, but put it like that, he lives in so Cork East does he have the name recognition? That's the issue. Yeah, I think his CV and getting people like that into politics is fantastic. 
But put it like this, I would have, if I was Secretary General of Fine Gael, I would be putting him out last November and building him up with the grassroots and so on, not on the eve of a convention trying to get him through. Uh, so they, they, they could end up with one seat in South, one seat in Midlands, North West, and no seat in Dublin. An effing disaster for the party. And you know what? John Carroll and Leo uh, are going to get some kick in the backside if that happens. OK. What about Holly Kearns and the Social Democrats? They had their annual conference some last week. Some light relief, yeah. <laughs> um, I was actually taken by a, a tweet by the political economist from UCD, Aidan Regan, who said, really, the Social Democrats, Labour Party and Greens are all after much the same thing. They should come together and be the one party. I mean, I don't think that's obviously going to happen in advance of a general election. But is that where they're going? That in many respects, Labour and the Social Democrats are almost indistinguishable. They have some slight differences in opinion based on Labour having gone into government in the past with Fine Gael. But they essentially believe in the same things. And most of those things are essentially the same things that the Greens actually believe in as well. Yeah, well, first of all, it, it really, whether it's Ivana Bacek promising 100,000 houses, Holly Kearns promising 50,000 houses, never wore a hard hat, uh, not saying how they're going to do that, how they're going to change the planning laws, how they're going to change infrastructure delivery, all the things we've talked about, uh, no credibility. Uh, look, she, she she's not only inexperienced, Holly, she's a one-term TD, but, uh, you know, I think she's naive as well, to be honest with you. And, uh, sorry, very, very appealing middle Middle class, you know, she looks the part. She's a polite person. Real middle class appeal. Uh, I noticed she wants to reintroduce the eviction ban, which was one of the big mistakes of this government. Once you do it, how do you ever rescind it? But the point I want to make is this. What is in the undergrowth that you need to, to, to look at here with their, with their six TDs? Catherine Murphy and Roisin Shortall, one is 70 and the other will be 70 in a couple of months. Is it guaranteed that they're going to stand in the next election, next autumn? I have my doubts, right? So they could actually go into that election with four TDs and doing well, because I actually went through their councillor base. They have 18 councillors. They were formed in 2015 after the local elections, and they have about 60 candidates declared for the local elections. And their pockets of strength are in the cities, Limerick, Cork, uh, and Dublin and essentially and bit in Galway. So the, the point is this, there isn't a queue up of uh, potential successors to some of these problems. So some I'm, of these I'm, TDs, so, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at maybe six or seven seats after the next day. Uh, I don't see this holly momentum that people are talking about. Which then means that whatever is left of the Labour Party mm-hmm. and whatever is left of the Greens and whatever is left of the Social Democrats might be forced out of necessity to come together as long as personalities can actually meld what with each other. What a desirable hodgepodge of an authoritative government. Give me I'm a break, suggesting Now, now you're putting me into a depression but, but completely. What but what may happen is... Bad enough Leo and Michal dropping the ball and being this marshmallow soft centre government. Okay, I mean, like now what you're offering me now is a licorice, all sorts of complete indecision, procrastination and weakness. Because what I'm suggesting to you is the numbers might be that instead of Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, and the Greens, it'd be Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, the Greens, Labour and the Social Democrats. Well, all of that is is based on the fact that Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are going to be around to form the next government. I've told you repeatedly that I see Fine Gael going into opposition. I think that whole pre- preposition is a flawed premise. Uh, and it won't be Leo making that decision. So th- that's all. I, jo- I fundamentally disagree well, with that. We, but we'll get, no, we'll get to that later yeah, yeah, exactly. in the year. We'll but sorry, there is, the there is this theory being put forward that Mary Lou for Taoiseach and Holly Cairns for Tornista. Sorry, just not buying that today. Why not? Simply because it doesn't... The numbers won't add up. And also, uh, that is effectively Sinn Féin will run the, the whole thing. You know yeah. what I mean? The, the numbers won't add up yeah. for that as well. I mean, and that becomes the question, we'll get back to it later today, but that essentially means... For Sinn Féin to get into power, almost certainly it's going to have to be with Fianna Fáil. Well, not, the, the magic not, figure is 90. Not, 90. not the parties of the left or of the middle left. 90 TDs. Go okay. construct it. It's, it they're, like, whatever, however well Sinn Féin will do, you know, they, 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 they won't do that well. I wanted to talk about spending our money in the north. 50 million on Casement Park in Belfast and 600 million on the A5 uh, road, which, which will go through uh, Tyrone and Derry between Donegal and Monaghan. 
you're not particularly keen on talking no, about no, that. No, 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 no. But put it like this: I'm, I'm actually going to be agnostic on this. I, I wouldn't de- deprive Caseman Park of the fifty million. I actually think it, it may be. There's an awful lot. If you look at the sixteen billion in, in capital spending, you look at all the announcements. And you look at what's actually spent and actually something like 20% of public capital programme that's announced is never spent. Well, I'd, and I'd uh, say, Case Park. But I I'd want say to... two things on that, sorry. One is that uh, the people of Cork and Limerick must be looking at the desire to spend 600 million euro in the north on a road when we're still waiting nearly 20 years on for the motorway between Cork and Limerick. That is apparently moving slowly towards implementation. There may be an well, application Well, the Greens did everything they could to scupper Absolutely. that. Absolutely. 1.4 billion it would actually cost an essential to link the second and third cities of the Republic. As for Caseman Park, uh, it, I'm amused a little bit uh, that and I can see In why. In fairness, it's no, cosmopolitan no, the Euros uh, for football. Yeah, for two football matches. 50 million quid for two soccer Better matches. Than none. Which the Northern Ireland football fans who like going to Windsor Park might not even turn up for because they don't want to go. Now, it might be a good way of forcing them to head up the Andersonstown Road and whatever in peaceful search of entertainment and the rest of it. But the point here is, is that we've just recently seen a disastrous investment in Parky Cueve. We have too many grounds around the countries dedicated to single sports. And you couldn't say, well, yes, there'll be a couple of soccer matches played in the new Caseman Park. But that'll be it. All the other Northern Ireland matches will be back in Windsor Park. I don't think Ulster Rugby are going to be sending many games over there, having made their reinvestment in Raven Hill. So here we are again, investing loads of money in a single-use stadium that'll be full once a year, once the Euro 2028s are over. And I'm having been at many Ulster football finals and Clonus. Clonus is a fantastic venue for those games. Uh, what happened is the game will be played once a year in casement and they won't be able to fill the ground any the rest of the time. But there's a good political reason for doing it, I suppose, and it's irritating the hell out of the DUP. So maybe that's a good use of 50 Yeah, they should quid. ring Irish Life for Aviva and see what they pay for a stadium. But look, can I say this? Uh, because we're running out of time. Two people died I want to make reference to. Uh, Mrs. Maureen Mullins at 94 produced a whole dynasty of sons, grandsons and, and others. More, I'm not well, aware well of. Willie Mullins uh, is her son, Tom Mullins, Tony Mullins, George Mullins. They, they are... This is the horse racing The horse racing thing. <laughs> but not only that, uh, the other person that died and, and sadly she was buried in Goresbridge last Friday, uh, uh, Michael O'Regan uh, passed away. Ah, yeah, Michael yes, was a... It was a regular on our Tonight Show yes. and, and on many chat shows on your ubiquitous radio and TV. But the point I'm trying to make is that he, he was a guy... Because I, I like people who take the content of what they take seriously. We had stand up, knock down, drag out, rouse, but he he never took himself too seriously. And I love that in someone who has that ability to change gears. He was but in. the other thing, I have to talk to you next week about the scandal of all scandals. We're spending about 500 million on road safety. And you know what happens? Out of 21,000 people who have been disqualified drivers, 16,000 of them, are still driving. They never handed in their licence. It's a joke. Well, we will get to that next week, but I can tell you now what I know I want to discuss in detail next week because it will be our only opportunity to do so, the two referendums. Okay. We actually have to have a discussion yeah, yeah. about those uh, because that'll be the last chance to do well, so. Well, one thing I'll say about that is the definition of durable relationships doesn't include Matt and Ivan. And on that note, that is the end of Path to Power, Episode 9. We look forward to talking about durable relationships and other issues in Episode 10 next week. If you've enjoyed this, please subscribe and please let your friends and family know that they can get to listen to this too. And uh, you may not agree with any or all of it, but we hope that it informs and entertains you. So from me, Matt Cooper. And from me, Ivan Yates. A very goodbye to you. 